Good evening, everybody. Welcome to The Rock Shop with Ralph, your source for all things entertainment. It's been a busy week, and I can't tell you how, to, how exciting I am, right? How excited I am right now to have my next guest. He's appeared in major motion pictures and one of the best shows ever on TV. Let me give you some of the movies he was in. American Gangster, The Irishman, um, and the best show on television, The Sopranos, where he played... Eugene Pontecorvo. Let's give it up for Mr. Robert Funaro. Thank you very much, Ralph. How you doing, Rob? The rock shop. Let's rock and roll, baby. That's me, rock and roll. Well, we were just talking off the air, and I got to tell you, you know how much of a pain in the ass I've been contacting you trying to get you on the show? I'm so happy it happened because, you know, things happened with this COVID season and everything, and things got mishmagoshed and so, but I'm, I'm finally, we finally uh, hooked up. Cool. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We finally got that. And, and my wife will tell you, if you ever meet her, how excited I was. I'm like, I got, I got Robert Funaro. Get him. She's like, then she, then she's like, Robert Funaro. I know you mentioned the name. I, I'm like, Gene brought the Corvo. You know, she says, Oh, the guy who hung himself. I go, yeah, that's him. Cause we love the show. Yes. But um, how are you doing? Good. I'm doing, I'm doing great. Feeling good. Right. Well, some weight because of COVID and, I had to lose it like many, many people who were living inside. They were eating everything and anything they can, uh, they weren't able to do. They, they, uh, they ate the seven deadly sins, fat, fat, and fat. You know? So uh, I lost some weight and I, I feel a lot better. Right. Let's talk about um, your start in acting. Um, How did you get your start? Well, I mean, professionally, my start was I was blessed to have James Gandolfini in my life prior to Sopranos. Awesome. We had done a play which toured Europe called A Streetcar Named Desire. I played Stanley, he played Mitch, and we toured Scandinavia, Finland, Norway. We started with Sweden, then we went to Finland, then we finally went to Norway. Um, James played Mitch, uh, I played Stanley, as I said. And we became friends and it was really a great tour. We got played, paid 600 Deutschmarks a, a, a week. And that was pretty, pretty good. The dollar was, I mean, the Deutschmark was really the highest form of currency then. So that was really my first professional start. And then about eight or nine years later, I would run into James. I used to work at Caroline's on Broadway. And I started there as a bouncer slash um, uh, doorman. And uh, the comics used to laugh at me. You know, they used to make fun of me. He's a skinny because I was, I weighed really, I was a lightweight then, pretty skinny. But you're tall. Uh, yeah, I'm tall, but that's the reason why they liked me. I was tall, but yeah. skinniest bouncer on Broadway. <laughs> I was like, anyway, so I ran into James. You know, this is afterward. You, you know, I would run into him time, time and again in Hell's Kitchen. He'd be drinking, he'd say hello. And we actually got together one time with John, uh, one, of the, one of the players, John, and we had a dinner together. But that was later on. And then time passed. James went to Hollywood. He became what he became out there. And then he landed Sopranos. And I was working at Caroline's as a manager. And a friend of mine was invited to a party where he was invited to during the sec end of the second season. And my friend, Gordy Silver, he went up to him and he said, hey, if I was you, I know a friend of yours. His name is Bobby Fennell. Yeah, Bobby, you know Bobby? What's up with Bobby? Well, if I, forget about that. If I was you, I'd get him a job on Sopranos. And he really had the, um, the Cleones to go and do that with James. And James, you know, is a great guy. Very, you can approach him. Uh, and most of the time you could, unless you're a paparazzi or something like that. And you wanted something from him that, you know, you didn't want to give to you, his personal life and stuff. Anyway, Jimmy um, took that in and uh, James asked, where I was working, what's Bobby doing? And Gordon told me he's a, he's a manager. I was a manager at the time at Caroline's. And when season three came up, they were looking for a role and James remembered and he thought I was right for that role. And um, he went with Joe Fahey, his driver, great Joe, uh, to a couple of clubs one night prior to the shift because James knew about bars and everything about five o'clock when I used to get in. And... Uh, I walked down the stairs at Caroline's and cause you've got to descend if you've ever been there um, yes. down the steps and, and guess who's at the bar is uh, Jimmy and he's having a drink and I see him and we, 
we have a little reunion and I say, what's going on? What are you doing? Are you going to see a show? No, I, I came to ask you if you'd like to audition for a role on Sopranos. I can't promise you anything. I tried to get someone else in and it didn't work out, but. If you know but, who it was, did we try to get in? I don't know who it was, but I will tell you that he, I auditioned for Ralph Seferetto. Oh, did you? So Pantaleone's role and uh, I did land that role. Really? Yes, I landed that role. I can't see you doing that. You know, that's what Jay the Chase said. He couldn't see me doing it once. No we way. Joey Pants fucking took that over. That was him yes. to a T. You're yes. Eugene Panikovo. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, we had tried. We had, we had did three or four shoots with, with the character. And I even said, look, give me another shot at the character to try to get the differentiation. They grayed out my hair. They try to... But in a way, me and James were pretty much alike in the sense of our, I guess, our spirits and everything, you know, and it kind of clashed. These people had a clash. And Joey was originally the guy that they really wanted. Uh, they couldn't find another one. They got me and, um, and and they went back to Joey and they asked them. And of course, Joey made a deal with them. And, and, I, and I was asked to stay and, and play a character called Eugene. And who is Eugene? His last name is Pontikova. We'll make it up as we go along. <laughs> right, and they, they did and that. Did. Yeah. Well, I gotta say, I love uh, every time every time uh, we mention Joey Pants and Ralph Silverado. You know what this fucking sick bitch wanted to do to me? She wanted to stick a dildo in my ass and try to pin me out like I was a hooker. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's very good, Ralph. That's pretty good. Well, let me, I'll get you my Joe Pesci too if you want to hear that. Forget about that. Okay. But um, yeah, uh, my favorite show by all by. A long shot. Um, huge fan. You can see I got my Sopranos up there. But what I find with you is how how you speak now. Your diction. You're very passive, just like James Gandolfini. You, you don't have that Pontecorvo accent like in the show when you did. Your your voice is so different. Yes, uh, it, it, you have to turn it on and, and turn it off if you're going to have a little bit of diversity. Although a lot of people typecast us. And James had a voice that people don't realize if they watch, if they look at the credits, they, they, they will see clearly that James had a voice coach. Who a dialogue with, coach. Dialogue coach, yes. Who helped with the dialogue. Well, I right. think there, there was some truth in that. And I also think that part of that was James' way of saying that I can do more than just Tony Soprano, which he proved that he could. He proved it time and again. Oh, yeah. And he was a great actor before The Sopranos. He did yeah. so many movies, and yeah. then he, he was one of those guys where you're like, oh, yeah, he was in that movie. He was in that movie. He was in 8mm. You know, he was in uh, a he was that. I love that. I love the 8mm. But, um, yeah, he was he was just been around. He was in, I was just watching him before with Fallen with Denzel Washington. Um, he always played the cop or the tough guy with the mustache, you know. But um, let's talk about this. Perfect. Yeah, Perfect. yeah. Let's talk about the Sopranos. And, and I would say, Jesus. James is so photogenic, really. He has that 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 thing they call that essence that just so good. He is Tony Soprano. I mean, you know, uh, you wouldn't think anybody else besides Tony. Like when you said you this is Ralph Cipharetto, I'm like, what? It just did. did it, yeah, I spoke about that on Talking Sopranos. I think it's important to talk about because there's a lot of actors who, um, and it happens a lot in music too. I mean, I was just reading about the Foo Fighters in the. Um, in um, the um, Rolling Stone and about uh, the drummer. What's his name? I forgot his name. Ella Hawkins. Yeah. And he was Dave Grohl about, was the drummer in Nirvana. Yes, I know. But the singer, was, Taylor the Hawkins. Line, in the beginning, he's having trouble with the drum line and Dave would uh, get in and he had to feel comfortable. And you got to get your own niche. So it's important. I think the actors know that not all the time you go in a straight line. You got to kind of you know, you kind of move in and out and then you find your, your little niche. And I did. So. Right. Well, well, one of the most, you know, a lot of people don't understand this. So I, I think it's, I got you. One of the most, uh, the, the, my best, my favorite episodes was members only. That was the one where you, you played Eugene Ponticovo. You wanted to get out of life. Um, yep. Silver lining. My aunt was, Vic, my aunt's husband was Victor Borg's agent. She left me a cold three mil. <laughs> 
pick the ball good. I laugh every time you said that because I remember seeing those stupid commercials with him playing the piano when I was a kid. Always wondering, who the fuck is Victor Borga? I never even heard of this guy, you know? But he's always up there playing the piano. And then I never heard of him for years until the surprise when you said your aunt, your aunt uh, married, was married to Victor Borga's agent. Yeah, and she made- know, he, he was a very good musician uh, and pianist. But yeah. he, I think, he, I think he found his niche telling jokes with, around the piano. But he was right. a <laughs> so I realize a lot of people but don't I, know. But anyway... Um, Let's talk about that episode. A couple sure. of questions I have for you. The first thing was um, when, I mean, I don't know if, if it, like you said, they were developing the character uh, as, as the show went along. There was a couple, I know David Chase liked to do uh, imagery and, and like hit, hidden messages and stuff like that. When you, when you went and killed that guy, Teddy, because you wanted to get out of life and, and, and Chris tells you, I'll, I'll, I'll try to put in a good word for you, that, that Florida thing. And he had a little bit of blood on his eye like that, and you wiped it off. What, yes. Did that mean anything? Yes, it did. It 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 it, it certainly was. Uh, um, it, it, it as you can see, it, it wouldn't come off. The blood, it, it was almost uh, Shakespearean. I don't want to say the name of that particular person, but mm-hmm. it was it was Shakespearean that, it, and it actually was written in the script. See, I knew. Very, it. Terry Winter, who wrote it, it wasn't my idea. Sometimes actors come up with great ideas, but that was right. a great one because he couldn't get the blood, you know, and you can never erase the blood. It was symbolic, I think. Right. I, 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 I know he, he picked up on that. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know he did a lot of sim, symbol, symbol, symbols and stuff like that. They, they said drop you know, the when, when I watch it, I say, geez, you know, I'm looking at it, but am I looking? I look at the road, and I'm, sometimes I say, man, you got to look at the road a little bit more. I'm a little bit more detailed. Right, you're going like that. We're on a trailer, you know. We're we're on a uh, I'm on a, a a tow truck trailer, and we're filming it. So I'm moving, actually moving, but and we're filming, and and, and some people know you you know you got a truck in front of you, and do you know what I mean? And they superimpose everything. Right. And, you know, you want to get out of life. You go to Tony. You say, Tony, listen, my father died at 52. I'm 47. You know, I like to get out. He says, we, we go a little way along back, Tony. He goes, CYO basketball. You know, so you and him were friends and you wanted to get out. And, and ultimately, he doesn't let you out. And and um, <laughs> two things I got. Another thing I got to ask you. Do they give you an idea how long he was? Because it turns out you were an informant. You had you were an informant. You were ratting on, on, on guys. You don't know who you were ratting on because they don't really tell, show you. Well, I think and, that happened because I had a gut feeling that it wasn't going to happen. I mean, it happened. What One of the main things that they they tried to build up, especially the scene with the, when I find the uh, the drugs, because that was added on later on. Yeah, your son was a drug addict. Yeah, but that was kind of added on later on. And... Uh, we reshot that because they wanted the walls to be closing in on me in right. all directions. They they felt that if we can get him to compress him, you know, into a corner, that he would do something like. To me, it was to to kill myself for my family so I can free them and liberate them. Although they didn't say that, Michael calls me a mutt, and uh, and they don't have a lot of good things to say. But in my heart, I think I, I, I mean, and I think it's also quite clear when I look at my family pictures before I hang myself that I'm right. uh, really thinking of them. But, you know, that's, that was my personal uh, interpretation. Of and then you, you're uh, ready. They inform me because some people say, oh, you're a rat. And I said, no, I, I never rat. I never ratted on Tony. I never gave him up because I killed myself. Right. So, so you, you don't know. Rat. Yeah. Nothing that I did, nothing that I did affected, although Tony was shot at the end of that episode. So yeah. that was worse. But another thing I did, so sometimes I call people out when they tell me stupid bullshit, Mike. <laughs> Gets your man, right? It's like, it's like, it's like you're Eugene Potacola when you tell me, I ain't no fucking rat. I kill myself. Well, well they take it seriously, some people. Yeah, you know, I know. Yeah. I hear you. And then, you know, you, you put the off, wait, the, the split level, the two bedroom, when your wife, she's all excited with that deep voice. That was, that was pretty good. Um, And you're like, deep. Did I tell you? Did I tell you? I got on the watches. I got on the watches. You know, you, you you're trying you're trying to butter them up. You're trying every fucking thing you possibly can. But um, and then how Silvio handles it 
when you you play in pool, he goes, listen, I I spoke to um, I spoke to the man upstairs and um, that Florida thing. He's reading the paper. I mean, and it's like ten seconds, but it's an eternity because you're waiting for him to say something. You know, and he goes, uh, eh, that's a no-go. You're part of the team. And then you were like, fuck, you know? So, but I fell for Eugene Ponacovo because, you know, you, you that always... That the first scene that we shot, you know, out of context, because you do that, and uh, you do that in in, um, in film and TV, you, you shoot out of context. You don't really shoot in chronological order, although some directors like to do that, but most times on TV you're shooting in um, non-chronological order. So that was our first uh, scene set up. And I, and I thought it came really well. You know, right. Yeah, definitely did. Um, one of the but, other... Yeah. You know, again, a scully comes by and starts talking about, it's just such an alternating current, one uh, happy and, and one who's fucking crazy. <laughs> right, right. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned Joey Ganiscoli. I love that scene. My favorite. I always fucking laugh. When you guys are on the construction site and little Paulie says, you want to know, sweetie. And you're like, <laughs> what'd you say? You go like this and you fucking whack him over the head with a fucking glass. Napple and, bottom, yes. Yeah, and, and, and everybody, they're all laughing. You're all laughing. And Finn is in the corner practically throwing up. He can't believe it, you know? And then Joey goes, I knew that was coming, you know? I mean, the guy's head is busted open, you know? And six guys just laughing, you know? You know, we seem to get hit, uh, call a, a little, a little Paulie. little Paulie, right? And thrown out the window. Yes. Remember Chris threw him out the window? Yes. <laughs> but yeah, listen, uh, you know, I wish, one thing I got to tell you about The Sopranos, and I, and I said this, I had John Fiore on as well. Two of my favorite characters, I always like to, you know, I like the guys that are believable. I, I believe, I, I believe you, as Gene Pontecorvo. I mean, you were, you were Gene Pontecorvo. And I believe John Fiore as Gigi. Very, very believable. Two of my favorite characters. You I know? think that John, uh, John, I mean, to me, he, he's a terrific actor. And I, I don't know. I mean, uh, it's it, you know, the, the, the dice roll the way they roll. Um, but uh, in, in hindsight, I, I think he really is underrated actor, John Fiore. Absolutely. Really Absolutely. And I said it, and listen, as I told you, I grew up with Ozone Park, Queens. He played that character to a T. He is the guys I see, grew up with on the street, hanging out in the neighborhood. You know what I mean? He looked, walked the walk. Really that, he's like, a, he's, he reminded me of, of, of I mean, <laughs> I don't know what he thinks about this. Uh, he has that like Dean Martin feel to him, his, his looks. Uh, extremely handsome guy. I mean, yeah. I mean, Johnny, <laughs> we're, we're, we're kissing your ass, John, if you're watching. Uh, this will be, yeah, be posted later. With that next project coming along. <laughs> I feel <laughs> laugh at that one. Anyway, exactly. no, it's true. It's true. He, he, he's, he definitely. Uh, there's really some a lot of talent there, you know. Yes, yes. So now on the Sopranos, um, how many episodes were you in? I believe 26. Sometimes I've looked at it and, and I, I'm not sure. 26 or 28 episodes. Uh, out of all those episodes, what was your favorite? Well, you know, let's face it, members only has to yeah. be my favorite because the thing was up till then I was known for the Snapple bottle because people remember you by your actions. I've said this in many, many podcasts. I, I referred to a streak. I mean, I referred to on the waterfront in Marlon Brando interview, and he was talking about his character of Terry and, and uh, the taxi cab uh, speech about, I could have been a contender. Could have been I could a have, contender. Could have been somebody. And he said, another actor could have done it, and it would have been as effective, maybe not as good as him, but they would have remembered because it would have been memorable because of the fact that everyone could have been a contender. A lot of people could have been, not everyone. A lot of people could have been. They made the wrong choices or something happened. Someone got in between. And, and so people can relate to it. And here it is. When I got members only, I said, wow, finally, I got something to chew on. And, I, and also the fact that how many people can relate to wanting to get out of something, doing something, and not being able to. I circumstance you. situations okay. so i thought that that would be this would be an episode that in a way and it wasn't in a sense that it was it won an emmy award for i was part of that yeah, uh, yeah. for best uh dramatic episode that season so yeah, i'm really I, proud of that great 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 episode 
Now you're on a basically a week to week basis with that. You don't know what's going to happen. They they tell you they tell you Gene, Gene's getting going to kill himself. How how soon before? No, I mean. Or you knew the end result when you got the part. They usually were contracted for like four or five episodes if you were if you were a regular. Right. And then if you were going to get whacked or whack yourself, David Chase would give you a call, and he gave me a call. And then when that phone rings, you're like, fuck. Prior to the call, uh, on the grapevine, I was saying, hey, 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 Rob, because you know, I have other actor friends, do you know that you have a wife this season? I said, wow, I have a wife. That's this is good. It may be bumping the me split up. level, the two bedroom. Yes. <laughs> and you know you have a son. And uh, so I said, wow, this could be great. But then I got the call from David. And he says, look, I, Bobby, I got some great news. And. I got some bad news. What do you want to hear first? And I said, well, give me the good news. And he said, well, we wrote, or Terry wrote, uh, um, members only, and you're in the whole episode, and it's about you and your life, and you get $2 million. And I may not have said that, but you know, it's a great episode. You're throughout the whole episode. And I just said, well, what's the bad news? Oh, the bad news is that you're dead. Right. <laughs> okay. And not only did you die, you hung yourself and you peed your pants. I did that too. Yeah. Well, yes, happens, we know what happens to most people. Yeah, that happens, you know, when you when you lose your body function. Not only did I not only did I, I hang myself, the one of the longest hanger scene. Yeah. Yes, the pants, pissing of my pants was also another. <laughs> and they named the episode members only. And all throughout that, you always wore that members only jacket. Yeah, and then you saw it in the final episode, the members only jacket too. So I mean right. And you were the last member. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, I was. Uh, uh, surprise. Who were some of the car? Who were some of the? You made a lot of friends on that show. You're still friendly with today. Oh, John. Uh, I'm friendly with John. I'm friendly with uh, Vincent Pastor. Um, I've done numerous stage production with Vincent Pastor. I'm part of the Renegade Nation. Maureen Van Zant. Uh, she played of, Silvio's wife. Yes, she's part of the Renegade Nation theater theater actors. I've done plays with them and. It was great to work on plays with Vincent. He's really a passionate theater. And he, and he was on Broadway, uh, Bullets Over Broadway. Um, and um, so and I, he was in Goodfellas. Yes, he was. He had this, the coats and, and, oh, and right. Tony Darrell tells him, you don't want the coat. He says, no, no, we'll, we'll put him in the freezer. That's yeah. Vincent Pastore. Yes, that's correct. Or Pastor, I'm sorry. I've, I've, st I've stayed in touch with you know. I'm a, I guess with Vincent, I'm the closest, and Maureen, and little Stevie too, little Steven. So I, I, I got to tell you, yeah. Shows, and I and bump into him during in the cutting room when he's doing. Who's that? Stevie Van Zandt. Okay. I'm invited to some of his shows. Maureen invites me to some of his rock and roll, the underground garage shows, and yeah, yeah. Little Steven and the Disciples of Soul, baby. The Disciples of Soul, I know. Right? He he was another one, man. What for somebody that didn't act before to him to go into that part and get that character that was fucking phenomenal with well, the hair. Know, I mean, a lot of a lot of you know a, a lot of acting. I mean, I think fifty percent is confidence. I mean, and then the other fifty percent, of course, is some training. But uh, and maybe in TV, maybe seventy percent is confidence, and the other thirty percent is being yourself. And let's face it, you can't face Stevie. He's played up in front of. 24,000 people. Yeah. And I mean, he's been under the gun and he's probably got the apple, but uh, a few times. But, you know, other than that, he's, he's done with the getting the apple after being with Bruce in the East Street band. So yeah. and, and anything thrown his way, such as that, I mean, he did a great job. You know? Absolutely. One of my favorite, the, the best, the best one liners on the show came from, I believe, came from Uncle Junior. Uncle Junior and Paulie had some good one liners. Uncle Junior, you know, uh, the feds are so far up my ass, I can taste bro cream. You know, uh, he goes, uh, <laughs> I've been fought into the same ass cushion for eight months. You know, he tells he tells uh, Bobby Bacala, how many white castles did you have? He goes, I don't have any because I smell them on you, you son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah, Steve Stripper, also, I'm friends with Steve. He calls from time to time. He, and... and uh, He's so, doing. Um, I'm sorry, the bigger show, the Talking Sopranos podcast, but um, yeah. I mean, listen, uh, we're, we're gonna move on to some of the other stuff you did. I could I could talk to you for hours about the Sopranos, but um, let's talk about the ending. What do you think happened? I, I thought you know, although 
after many saints of Newark, uh, David had spoke about the ending and, and he said a few things. I still think that Peter Bogdanovich, his explanation of the ending- Who played Elliot Kupf Kupferberg, the psychiatrist to Lorraine Brockle. That's the explanation that it was, uh, what you saw there was a, a perpetuity of, 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 of the black hand of the mafia. It will always continue whether or not Tony Soprano dies or not. You saw the members only jacket? Yeah, saw I saw that members only jacket. You saw the Boy Scouts. You saw the, uh, the rappers. Yeah. Uh, you saw the American diner, you know, with the onion rings. It's, it was a cross section of America. And you, you, were, you were given, a, 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 the, the, I would say the, 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 the rights or the, um, the, you know, the, to your own opinion. Um, you know, and, and I think that to me, he was never killed um, that particular night. He might have met his end right. uh, when he walked out or, or, or another time or something happened to him. Um, even look at John Gotti. He might have had an end like John Gotti. You have to, you have to uh, decide what you think happened. I don't think he was killed that night. I think that he met in perpetuity what happens to many, many wise guys. Lucky Luciano he, and, right. uh, and Paolo Gambino. He, I don't think he had the end, the same end as Carlo Gambino, who lived his life till old age, although he was bothered by the law. Yes. Uh, um, but I think he has a, a I think Tony Soprano at this particular juncture in, um, in time um, mm -hmm. didn't, um, you know, die of natural causes. Yeah. I, so that's I, my I know, interpretation. I mean, I noticed the members only jacket right away at the at that episode. I'm like, what the fuck? I know that means something because you know it's the same jacket oh, that you could have you could have said in your, to yourself, well, oh, that fuck that guy. I'm sorry for cursing. That guy that, that, that guy may have killed him, but we didn't see it. And no. he had a striking resemblance to his father. Yeah, that actor, you know. And I was like, I'm trying to put stuff together, you know, and my mind is going wild. And then the fucking the screen goes blank. And I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck? It doesn't matter, like, and James did Caveman on Broadway, which was about relationships and marriage that we were as primal as we were back in the days before Christ um, and, and, uh, and after Christ. So, I mean, we're as primal. And so I think that the wise guys is a primal thing. It's always going to be around. But it was, it, I think many people uh, misconstrue why it was created was created uh, back in Italy or wherever you want to, or maybe other places too, because the people in charge were uh, exploiting the workers and they were raping their daughters and stuff like that. So people banded together, families banded together to protect them. Right. And that's the foundation and the roots of uh, La Cosa Nostra. And then of course, it, when that was taken care of, it varied into different things like gambling and loan sharking, which was one of the biggest things in the beginning, the loan sharking, then became right. prostitution and the other things, you know. Women and gambling. Yeah. All right, well, let's let's move on to your movie career because you were in some big movies. Uh, like I said, I could talk, this could be a whole episode of Talking Sopranos. I, and if you ever come on again, we can talk more about it. I could talk for sure. hours about it. Sure, um, are you noticed, when you're on the street, are you noticed, that they notice you from the Sopranos people? Basically. More more Sopranos than than the films that I've been in, right? Because the films that I've been in, uh, as we talked before, are not like members only. Something that's memorable that sticks in people's mind. They might say, "Oh, there's a guy who's done a few films," right? And sometimes the Irishman, but more more Sopranos than anything else. Well, you were in a big movie with Denzel Washington. Uh, you were in uh, American Gangster. Yes, I was. You know uh, that that was uh, you know a great movie. What I do you thought remember? it was a terrific film, uh, yeah. and Denzel was great, and, and so was, uh, you know, Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe. And uh, that, that, what, that was a, a great movie, Marin. You were also in The Irish, uh, we'll move up, uh, Vinyl, one of, the my, one of the TV shows I got attached to, and they canceled it. You played yeah. Tony Del Greco. American Gangster, well, let's go with American Gangster first. American yeah. Gangster was great to work with Ridley Scott. This was after Gladiator. And right. And it was really a positive set. And uh, Russell Crowe came up to you, came up to me first day on the set, said hello. And and you know, it, it's not true what they say about him. He's really yeah. uh, gracious and, and a gentleman. 
and a, a soft, you know, a hard uh, spoken person and, and excited about working with other New York actors. And uh, Armand Asante was in that. And James, uh, Josh Brolin. I was going to say, what about Josh Brolin? How was he? It was an experience. I played his partner. So it was great. Yeah. To work with Josh and, I hear things I mean, about him too. Don't really keep in touch. He really kind of, when is but he lives in LA. If he was here in New York, I'm sure we would get together, have dinner, and, and hang out and everything. <laughs> it was really a great experience to hang out with. He's kind of crazy, but a good crazy, a good He's crazy. Nuts, right? I, I can't believe that was the guy from the Kid in the Goonies. <laughs> a lot of people, well, people recognize him from the Goonies. I mean, uh, yeah. Put, you know, afterward, and then he had that nice mustache. He played a really good part. Shoots the dog. What a, what a sick bastard that he was. Yeah. He was kind of like Ralphie Sofredo too, right? Yeah. I'm like I'm Ralphie. But um, yeah, so vinyl, we'll move on to vinyl. That was a TV show that I was starting to follow. I started started getting m- momentum and then they dropped it. I don't understand. I was pretty taken back because I have my friend Armin Garrow who played You mentioned uh, him. Damn. I, I was gonna, I was gonna tell him save him yes. for the re- for the end of the show. Another one of my favorite actors, Coco. What a great yes. character he played. Armin yeah. Garrow, you're doing a movie with him, but we'll talk about it at the end of the show. Go ahead. Talk. So, um, Armin called me up and, and said, uh, or he texted, I think he called me up and said, did you not hear anything in news? I said, no, I hear news. They canceled the show. I, I couldn't believe it because people really reacted to it. They were really loving yeah. it. Yeah, you know, but I, you know, along the way, there were rumors, you know, because Mick Jagger, the, the idea, the, the germination Excuse me. The idea, I believe, was Mick Jagger's. And of course, they're like him and Marty are simpatico. Of course, easy. Yes. And um, he had, I think, broached the subject um, about this, I guess, I suppose, after seeing some of Martin Scorsese's films like Goodfellas and, and Mean Streets and those kind of wise guy films that Marty does so brilliantly and ingeniously. If that's a word, geniusly, I don't think so. His genius. It's not right. <laughs> anyway, it's a Pontecorvoism. I mean, there's a lot of corruption, and and I guess Jagger was thinking of Morris Levy and all the corruption and the wise guys, and they had somebody write a script, and it was sitting around for a long time, and uh, I think that uh, it was it was looked at by Jagger again, maybe. Um, Martin Scorsese and and of course they were producers on the show. Look, Empire with you know, Marty had produced with Terry Winter and Terry did a great job with Boardwalk Empire. I guess they were looking for something, another subject matter, and they said, "Well, right. why not Mick Jagger?" And this is how it came to be. I thought it was really good, but I did hear rumors that that there was a little bit too much killing. There was too much, uh, not so much the wise guys. I mean, that it was kind of lopsided with the music and. I thought um, it was a great show. I, I thought it was, and I was pretty. And I think Marty, Marty Scorsese also was a little bit taken back. That I mean, how could they? I mean, I thought it was really great. I mean, Bobby Carnaval was terrific. And, oh yeah, I love him. Uh, it was great to pl- play uh, with Ray Romano. Yeah, a lot of people were really sad, and and I was too, of course, not only for the job, but I thought it was a pretty good historical. It, it kept a lot of facts. I mean, you can't get everything correct. I know people in the business who talk, well, you know, Levy did this, but that's wrong about that guy, and I said, well. You can't move films a half the right. history of imagination to. There's a little bit of romanticism in, in a lot of films, even in The Godfather. Yeah. When you look, you compare The Godfather to, to Goodfellas, you see two on Casino, you can you can see the difference of poeticism more in The Godfather as opposed to the, the, the reality of what is in Goodfellas and also Casino too. But I mean, I, not to say that uh, The Godfather is any less because I don't believe it is. I just think that it has a, a bit of more uh, poet poetry in it. Uh, it's sometimes it, I don't know. They're both great films. I got you. That's been on all. It's been on all week. Part but I one guess and part two. Had my generation of, of yeah. If you my generation of uh, who I grew up with, I would tend to think that Goodfellas is really very streety from New York, whereas. I knew more of the Goodfellas than I knew of the Godfather, but man, the Godfather was Coppola's genius masterwork. He's like Leonardo da Vinci to me. And then the writer, uh, Puzo, of course, and then there are other people he collaborates with are terrific. John Milius, uh, he's a writer. <laughs> yeah, writer. John, and he's directed too. He directed Red Dawn. 
Yes. Milius. Yeah, he was a yeah. writer and a director. He also did uh, uh, um, um, John Dillinger. He wrote yeah. and directed that. Mm-hmm. Now, you know uh, what? If you look at Dillinger, because I just watched it, you'll see the influences, I think, of some of the, the, shot, the shots that Coppola used. If you look at the, the reality, and there's some really great reality uh, murders in there, not that I'm up on murdering, but I, I looked at the, I was just looking at it, I said, man, that's just like the golf ball. That's just like the way it's shot. It has that same reality that you feel like. I mean, that was a bit romanticized with Warren Oates. And, yeah, Warren and Oates, what a great actor he was. Because he didn't look as flamboyant as Warren Oates played him as, but of course- as Sergeant Hulk. I'm, I'm not sure uh, Dillinger was like that. Maybe he was, and maybe I haven't done my research, but I'm not gonna question Sir Milius. But, 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 but you mentioned Warren not- Oates. You mentioned Warren Oates and, uh, you know, yeah, he was in Dillinger, he was in The Wild Bunch, all this stuff. But later on, I, I remember him mostly from Stripes with Bill Murray, he played Sergeant Hulk. Yes. He played a great character. But- um, Yes. Yeah, yeah. M- moving on. Um, the Irishman. Now I gotta say, I am a, I am a Martin Scorsese fan through and through. Uh, I, I follow him into the gates of hell. I wasn't crazy about that movie. You were in it. I was. What I wasn't crazy with was the CGI they did on De Niro with his face. You know, I, I just you couldn't. You get a second person tonight who told me the same thing. Oh yeah, I couldn't get past it. Was it was like. Almost like cartoonish, and here's one. You know, here's one scene where he kicks the he kicks the shit out of the guy in in the in the, the deli for touching his daughter. That was the fakest beat I've ever seen Robert De Niro give anybody. You know, I mean, it was very. But listen, beggars can't be choosers. Uh, I, I know I'm comparing that to Goodfellas and Casino and Mean Streets and, and everything else. Um, what's your take on that? How was your experience with that? You played Johnny from the Friendly Lounge. The experience was that it was great to work with Robert De Niro. I mean, he's just a consummate actor and, and, and genius. Uh, uh, that was a great uh, milestone in my career to work with such a great actor as, as, as he is. And of course, I knew some people that he knew. Uh, Ritanya Alder from Deer Hunter, who played opposite John, uh, I believe John Savage. Uh, yeah, John Savage, uh, I believe. Um, he was that was his uh, his that was her wife her husband um and also you know he was great in the deer hunter of course and then richard bright who was al neary oh yeah was, he was on good he was in the sopranos too richard was married to Ritania, but i know richard from our theater company with vincent i met uh, richard through vincent pastor our theater company and we became friends and became my mentor for two or three years i really hung out with him and uh, and listen to his wisdom and his greatness. Um, and he was a wonderful actor, great actor. Um, and it was in Sopranos too. So, I mean, yeah, the, the, that the, was, the, that was, I mean, that kind of broke the ice with Rob, uh, with Rob De Niro. And, and I, and the scene was great. Now, if you talk, I'm just talking about my personal experience. It was a great experience to work with Martin again. It kind of yes. keeps in the family. If he knows you and, He'll keep working with you, and that's right. the great thing about him. And you, when you work with him, you 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 make you know you you stick around, and he's like a great painter. He'll keep your rank. I, there was a couple of days I was kept around, and he didn't use me. There was a couple of days that I was kept around, didn't know what I was doing, and he did use me. So he's a wonderful, uh, like Coppola, a genius, right. and he likes to use his pa- uh, his uh, paints as or as his human beings are like his palette, and he creates as he goes along. That's how that is. Now to talk about the movie on a whole. I think the whole movie succeeds in, in talk, talking about how Jimmy Hoffa was, was murdered. Oh, right. Yes. And I think oh, that- Oh, he wasn't murdered. <laughs> I think that in, in that respect, it, the whole story and, and, and Russell Buffalino and, and Frank Sheeran and-, right. and, and Ray also, Romano was in that as well. And, and Ray, who played the brother of Buffalino. Yeah. I thought that it was, it was most excellent in that regard. Now, the CGI- I understand what you're saying, but you know, here's the thing. Um, you go to the theater and the question is, do you, you give yourself the gullibility or the belief that this could really happen? I understand what you're saying compared to Rob, some of Robert De Niro's other performances. They tried that for the first time, Ralph. 
that, well, not it wasn't for the first time, but they were able to do it. They, I don't think they would as let's say the, the script was ready 10 years ago. They wanted to do it and something happened. They couldn't do it. They put it on the shelf. The only way they could uh, have been successful is to do the CGI. And that's the why they went ahead with it. Wanted, that's why they went ahead with it because Robert would have never succeeded in showing the two parts. He wanted to play both parts. So some people say, well, why didn't they, why did they get like a young De Niro who played Vito Corleone? Yeah. But I think in this story, it would have been too lopsided that the, all the action really was in the beginning. And also at the end, he had to play that middle area. So uh, Marty, and, and you can't, you got to trust, and Robert De Niro, their instincts that I, he would play the whole film. I mean, I wouldn't question that. You know, would it have been a better film? I don't think so. I, but of course, at the same time, the CGI did look a little bit off. But, you know, it's just like I watching The Mandalorian. I just began watching about four or five episodes because my son said, watch this Mandalorian. And I you know I, it's a great series. But when I see the Mandalorian, I think of Flash Gordon and the jetpacks yeah. and how fake they looked. And they didn't really look real. <laughs> and they looked stupid. Well, and, what about uh, Superman? Remember Superman flying yeah, in the air? Superman too. But at the same time, I think that the CGI will be successful in about another five or six years or as technology advances. And it will. But... There are pioneers like Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro who, who have to take the chance, the, the chance on it. At the end of the day, it's really about the story, to me at least. To others, it's about the personal performances. I'm not saying that you're any different, but you know what I mean? I think it'll get better and better. Okay, one little bit of trivia for all you trivia buffs out there on the oh, movie, The Irish Question. Did I like the film? I liked it. <laughs> yeah, I got you. It's a long version. A little bit of <laughs> trivia which I'm crazy about on the Irishman was that the actress Welker white played, you know, who she played, she played Hoffa's wife, but do you know what movie she was in? Uh, Jimmy Hoffa's wife was uh, all Hoffa's wife. I'm yeah. Thinking. That was well, the actress's name was Welker white. She was the girl that played Jimmy Hoffa's wife. No, she know. was, she was Lois Byrne in Goodfellas. I need my hat. We got to go back. I got to get my hat. Yeah. She was the girl. What does she do? She calls oh, the airport. Right. That was right. her. That was yeah. her. Yeah. You see how, you see, but do you see how Martin? Uh, it, that's why I mentioned that. He, he brings back people that he's worked with years prior. So you're going back 30 years. Walker White was a kid playing Lois Byrne. The kid that got Henry Hill pinched on the phone, delivering the drugs with the babies, you know, and she... 30 years later, she's playing Al Pacino's wife, Jimmy Hoppe's wife in, in his thing. Anyway, that's... This is a tradition, an independent tradition. John Cassavetes did it uh, repeatedly with the players that he kept in his, his film company or theater company, you want to call it. Uh, a lot of European directors, uh, of course, Fellini being one, use the same people in and out of their films. Um, so De Sica... I mean, it's a tradition. Uh, uh, some filmmakers don't do it, but I think I, I think it's at, to the advantage of, of not only the actors but the, the the director too that they know who they're directing and, and they know what they're going to get personally. Because if you think about uh, Kazan, and Kazan had a wide variety of, of films that he did. He really rarely used the same people, but then again, he did use James Dean um, and and a few other people. Um, but another genius director who really, but what I wanted to say was he really didn't count on auditions to find out who the person was. He would personally talk to them, invite them into his office and have an interview with them. Jerry Lewis was like that too. I know I just diver digressed to Jerry Lewis, believe it or not, a great director, people don't know. Yeah. But, and and I, Scorsese's the same way. Even Robert De Niro is the same way. He wants to meet you and wants to sit. He didn't meet with See me. If you, if you have chemistry. Yeah, but the thing is, you got to in, in TV and film, you got to know that, that even though you can you can nail it at the audition, um, but you it sounds right, but you have to have it inside you, like you were talking about Joey Pants. You couldn't see him, you could see it, and you could see me doing Eugene. So you see what I'm trying to say. Come at it. That the essence they call it has to be there. So that's what Martin looks for, and a lot of great directors look for because they know that. If the person's capable, they can get a good performance from them, and they'll they can be. I mean, they'll do and we'll do anything to get it right. <laughs> I got you. Except kill. Except kill. Well, no comments, 
I, I'm going to tell you about the next project uh, that that, and this is the one I'm really pissed about that you were involved with was Ray Donovan, where you you played Lieutenant Bricker, in the last season. That was a fucking show that was neck and neck with The Sopranos. I love that show, and they fucking cancel it. They pull the rug out from under you. It's not even finished. You know, he, they're, they're building up and building up and building up. To something how, that's many, gonna Ralph, how many years was Ray Donovan on? Seven, I believe. How many seven. seasons? How many seasons? Seven seasons? Seven. Uh, yeah, I believe it was seven. Yeah, it was, it was seven. 2013 seven. to 2020 is seven years. I believe you were going into your eighth season. So the, the thing is that how long does it take to do that? It took, I, I did three seasons. It took me six years. Well, so you 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 were big part of the last the last well, year. What I'm trying to say is the actors like Lee Shriver. I mean, if you do a series like that, it takes 10, 12 years of your life. Do you know what I mean? There's a point, I think there's a point when you say, okay. But I'm I don't done. think it was him. Unless, unless you're Tom Selleck. I mean, <laughs> this is Tom Selleck. But Blue Bloods, right? It for, it'll be going on. He's forever. an 80-year-old police cap. <laughs> Patreon. I don't know if it was leave. I mean, I don't know. I mean, they got to come back with a movie or something to finish it up. They were. I thought they were. I didn't hear anything. I hope they are. They did say that they were doing one before COVID, but then COVID happened. So I don't right, know. Right. I'd love to see that because that was a great show. And you were on, you played Lieutenant Bricker. You know, you're always a, uh, you're getting, you got like typecast. You're the police, police or, or, or a mobster. Yes. The You're only, not going to be that, the, 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 the patriarch well, of a good, family. I, pl I played good cops. Uh, I, I'm a patriarch of a family and for nothing, this project. That's of, the new one's coming out. We'll talk about that in a second. Yes. But the thing is, is that, you know, in Sinner, I played a dad, a good dad, I think, uh, with uh, opposite Jessica Biel with Chris Mason. Uh, that was a good part. Uh, I mean, in terms of being non-typical wise guy. Right, 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 right. But you're right, I get more of those roles. Yeah, I see you as, you know, me me being of the Goodfellas, uh, Sopranos, Mean Streets, acting, love of that type of uh, movies, I see you as Eugene Pontecorvo. That's what I'm going to see you as, you know? You but, um, yeah, so Ray Donovan, uh, I know you were, you were on Blue Bloods, and you, you, you mentioned him before about your upcoming projects. Here's a couple of things I want to talk about. You got Pickwick Road coming out with another one of my favorite actors from The Sopranos, Armin Garrow, who played Coco. This guy was so... I, I always say... So you mentioned The Mandalorian and Star Wars and all that shit. I can never get into that because to me, it's not believable. I'm from the, the, the Goodfellas, Sopranos realm of Godfather. Stuff that you know can really happen. You know what I mean? And this guy, Coco... Is, is a typical guy I would see in my neighborhood all the fucking time. You know? Hey, best to, best to your dad for me. <laughs> the way he typical fucking laughed. Ball, typical ball breaker. Yep. And he was a cop, right? Almond um, was a, yes, he was a, he was a, a policeman in, uh, I believe, Rhode Island. Yeah. I didn't know that Armin was in Pickwick Road. I'm, I'm happy that he is. I did a small, you know little, I did a small little role. In, oh, in, yeah, he's so. in that. I didn't know. So this is good to know. I'll talk to him about that maybe tomorrow. Sometime. Tell him that you're on my show. And I, I sent him a message. I wanted to get him on and uh, just pass the, pass the message along. And if you can, I will. I, I really would love to talk to him because he was one. Of, I tell you, if I believe if you're believable, I'm there. I mean, that guy was so believable playing Coco. And what a when he did that scene. Was, vinyl. He was terrific on vinyl. vinyl. He's been in a lot of stuff. As Golasso. Yeah. Yes. Right. I right. mean, when Armin, Armin hangs a particular person and he puts him, that was Armin's idea. He's a good actor. He, 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 he put him on his back and he, and he, and, and he, and he, and he, he had lived a few lines like, uh, and he, and to me, he said, see, this is the way you do it, Tony, or something like that. See, you right. got to lift with your knees or something. Bend that with was, your knees. That, Bend your knees. That was just terrific. I mean, I auditioned for that role. I didn't get it. I got Tony, but I wasn't going to complain. It was just great to be on set with him and, and everyone else. Ray Romano and, and uh, Bobby Cannavale. Good people, good actors. Yeah. That reminds me of the, the, the scene in uh, The Departed with Jack Nicholson when they kill the couple on the beach and, and they're standing, they're both dead. And he goes, she fell funny, you know? <laughs> and you're like, 
these fucking guys. And then, 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 then he goes down with the sword to, to sore him in half. You know, that's, it's, it's, it's crazy how these little things, you, you know, and you say to yourself, wow, how'd they come up with that? And Jack Nicholson had lived that. Yes. But, um, one well, of, one of the, how you come up with it, I think, uh, Scorsese, I will say this, Ralph, that, you know, doing our takes, he gives you this one take and he says, okay, it's my best Scorsese. He just, uh, do yeah. what you want to do. Do what you want to do. Uh, uh, do it the way you feel it. Uh, just go ahead. We'll improvise this. Just, just go ahead. Do one your way. What way you want to do? Take the take that we did. I had ad lib on Irishman. That was the ad lib one that I did. I added to Steve Zalian's The Great Rider, Gladiator. And yeah. Um, and that's the way films are, and that's the way he works because he knows he get, you'll get it inside. So there were some things that I said that were indigenous to uh, to growing up around wise guys and everything. So I just want to say that he gives you that actor's freedom and he makes everyone, that's why he gets great performances from everyone because you're, yeah. you, feel, you feel like you're in a cocoon and you're safe and there's no one watching and, and, and judging you. No, it's like, well, let's create, every scene's important. All the actors are important. Right. That's why he gets great performances from everyone. One of the... you, I got you. I, two more things I want to talk about. One of the last movies that you have coming out is called Four Nothing. Uh, you got Michael Madsen and yes. Daniel Baldwin in that. That's a movie that's coming out. Another one of my favorite character actors, it's Robin. Was, actually, a TV series. Oh, it's a TV series. And do you know where it's going to air on? I don't know where it's going to air on. Uh, it was, I know it's, they're planning it to get it together now. There's another character actor that's in it who I love is Robert Lasado. Yes, Lasato's he's, he's, in it. You know, he's the Robert. crazy bastard with all the tattoos all over him. He yes. made he, he made a, a career out of playing crazy bastards with tattoos. <laughs> was he in Warriors? No, no. He was. It's funny because the first time I saw him was in a movie called Short Circuit. Um, you remember that movie with Johnny Five Alive? Um, he played one of the gang. Ever. Yeah. And then, then once I saw him in that, I just picked up on him. And I, every movie you see, like, oh, there he is again. There he is again. You know, he's one of those faces, you know. Yes. Um, last thing. Uh, what, Joe Pesci. What was it like working with Pesci? Well, I didn't. Because he came out of retirement to do that movie. I, I hate to backtrack, but I forgot to ask you. I didn't work with Joe. Uh, on. I, I did pass him, and I said hello to him. And we passed each other. He was going on the set. I was leaving the set, and I said hi. And he said hi. And that was it. Hey, how you doing? What's going on? I said hi, and we said hi. And he seemed like a very nice man, but I, I never really worked with him. And I think when you're acting, you don't really want to be starstruck because uh, James used to always tell me, if you're afraid to act with any of anyone, don't you better get out of the business now because you, that's the kind of confidence you need to have. Right. So... You don't really want to overstep. And, and, and uh, so, I mean, I didn't stop. Joe, how you doing? I'm on the film with you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'd love to. If you're working with, if you're working with someone, then you're, you're you know, then you just. You're not yeah. going to go to Joe Pesci and say, I loved you in Eight Heads in a Duffel Bag. <laughs> Get fired right away on that. Right. All right. Well, Robert, I, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, no, we, thank you so we, much. We it's a great we, discussion. Co we covered a lot of ground. Um, anything else you got coming up uh, besides those films? You, oh, here's a question I want to ask you. Did you ever try out for a movie or a TV show where you thought you were on the cusp of getting a part and you didn't get it? Anything, anything like major? Well, one of the things, uh, regrets I have is The Unusuals, which was with Jeremy Renner and Tamber Amberlin, uh, if I said her name right. Um, I think it's Tamber Amberlin. Um, but anyway, that was a, I went in for one line and that was about policemen. It was kind of a, a, a satiric, uh, a, but a serious uh, police show, but funny too, um, took place in New York. And I went in for one line and they kept me in the show around the, the, the headquarters. And I started getting more and more, we taped like three or four episodes. I still get some residuals from Europe from it. Really? aired it in Europe and uh, never really aired it in, in America um, and they canceled it but I was my role was becoming bigger and bigger and I was really saying wow this is great I mean my former manager passed away God rest his soul Eric Faber he got me the role the party said you want to go in and, and I just said yeah I don't care if it's one line I don't I don't I'll go in because you never know 
Uh, that's what happened on many of the characters in Sopranos. Actors went in for one line and they were right. kept in the show. So I did the same thing. And then Jeremy Renner did Hurt Locker and he, he was nominated huge. for Academy Awards. So, you know, it's a lot about timing. If he right. had Hurt Locker and then he did that, but then again, he might have not have done that after the Hurt Locker because he came another... He didn't have to do TV. He started working in film. Yeah, exactly. Something that, you know, you want to do, they accepted him in film. And, but anyway, that was one a, a regret because I thought that it really had wheels. It was very funny. Right. You know? What can I say? You mentioned, I, you mentioned residuals. Do you get residuals from The Sopranos and all the stuff you've done? Sure, I do. I, I get still get residuals from Sopranos, many of the things. Ray Donovan, American Gangster. They're always airing that. Um, right. Um, yeah, I mean, all the time. Yeah, you know, they, they they lessen in time. But now with the COVID thing going on... At least you have some sort of pandemic, income coming in. There's income coming in because people, especially with COVID in, at the beginning, people were inside... And watching stuff. Films. Yeah. You mentioned you mentioned Blue Bloods. Uh, you got a shot of, of being back on that? No, I think my character, uh, although he lived, he didn't hang himself. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think he was... A, it was a one-episode deal. So. Right. Okay. Well, listen, I want to thank Mr. Robert Funaro, Eugene Ponacorvo from The Sopranos, among many other films. Thank uh, you. He's, he's got a couple of movies coming out we mentioned, the TV show For Nothing and Pickwick Road. There was two projects that are coming up. And we're going to, I know we're going to see him more and more as the years go by. We just got to remember his face and know his name, Robert Funaro. He's not thank Eugene Ponacorvo, he's Robert Funaro. Thank you very much, Ralph. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. Thanks for doing the show, Rob. You're part of the family now. And uh, tell Armin, tell Armin I said hello. I will tell Armin you said hello and that you want to interview. You want to be I, love, to I love his character. Thanks a lot, Robert. I'll talk to you soon, buddy. Yeah, brother. Bye-bye.